Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're so glad that you're here at Alive Wesleyan Church. Welcome and let's stand and lift our praise to our Lord and Savior this morning. Uh, 
Uh, and the reason he chose January 22nd for that designation was this was the day the U.S. Supreme Court legalized abortion on demand in all 50 states, the famous Roe versus Wade uh, ruling. Uh, churches around the United States use this day as a time uh, to celebrate God's gift of life among us and to commemorate the many lives lost to abortion and commit themselves to protecting human life at every stage. Uh, fact is, over 60 million unborn children have lost their lives to abortion here in the United States. And there are some politicians that are pushing for even more radical abortion laws. And it's shocking to realize that from a recent study done among Christians that there's 44% of Christians in America that think the Bible is in ambiguous about abortion as to whether it's right or wrong. So that's why I've included a bulletin insert that speaks to that. It says, uh, the title of it is Abortion, What Does God Say? So I hope you can take a chance, uh, when you get a chance, uh, take a look at that and read it over uh, and be informed about what the Bible says. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, close with a word of prayer titled Redeemer in the Womb being prayed to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and we bow. Lord Jesus Christ, you took our human nature upon yourself. You shared our life and death, our childhood and adulthood. You also shared our time in the womb. While still God, while worshipped and adored by the angels, while almighty and filling every part of the universe, you dwelt for nine months in the womb of Mary. You were our redeemer in the womb, our God, who was a pre-born child. Lord Jesus, we ask you to bless and protect the children who today are in their mother's womb. Save them from the danger of abortion. Give their mothers the grace to sacrifice themselves in body and soul for their children. Help all people to recognize in the preborn child a brother, a sister, saved by you, our Redeemer in the womb. Amen. Now I'm going to watch a short video about uh, pro life.
I'll open it up to you. Give a, a word of praise this morning, or a word of prayer, something you prayer about. If you'd like to slip up your hand, we would love to be able to pray. Anybody have a prayer request or a praise this morning? Hey. It's Red. Red. Uh, Someone behind that. <laughs> Uh, my friend Sue uh, had a sonogram after her uh, breast exam, and uh, there's no issues. She's all set, so praise the Lord for that. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. You know, we prayed for Sue a couple weeks ago. We've been praying for our Wednesday nights for the sonogram coming up, and the sonogram came back clear, so praise the Lord for that. Lung surgery, so we're taking a look for that. Right for Michael and the kids, because he tries to keep them out of the little while. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's another great praise. Praying for Tara, she had her lung surgery, they ended up taking a full lung. Um, but again, Kathy's saying that was a praise in the recovery state, so praise the Lord for that. Tara's back home. Kelly? I'm, uh, was feeling pretty ill for a few days, and I thought I had COVID, so I got tested, and I'm negative. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We praise you and celebrate you, Lord, that you're God who cares for us, God who loves us, God who is mighty to save. Mark has testified that you're a God that goes before us. Father, that you are a sovereign God, an all-knowing God. As we study the book of Genesis, we've just seen how amazing, creative, powerful you are. We talk about how you're a God outside of time. And Father, what confidence that should give us as we lift up our prayers. The God of creation is a God who loves us. A God who can speak things into existence is a God who cares for our needs, that knows about us. A God who knows when a sparrow falls in the woods and knows the hairs of our head, knows us and loves us, knows the things that are on our hearts even before we have a chance to ask for them. And Lord, you are a great and loving God. Father, this morning we come before you and we praise you for that. Father, we praise you for these great testimonies this morning. Lord, that, that as we think through this prayer list, that almost every report that was given this morning was a praise of your healing power, your your greatness and your love. Father, we just praise you and thank you that Sue's test came back negative, that this biopsy showed nothing, Father. Lord, so we will praise you for that. Lord, so often it would be easy just to chalk that up to a medical mistake or a coincidence or just good luck. Father, help us to see the hand of God in work. That when people pray, when two or three are gathered in your name, that you are in the midst of them, Father. That the prayer of the righteous person is effective. So, Father, we thank you. We praise you for Sue's great report. We thank you, Lord, this biopsy came back clean, Lord. And we just pray for your, your hand to be upon her and continue to be upon her, Lord. Father, we thank you for the great report from Tara for her surgery that she's back home. Lord, just the amazingness of that, Lord, that less than a week after the surgery that she's back home with Michael and the kids, Lord, that she's doing so well, and we will continue to praise you for that. We thank you for going before Tara, being with her through the surgery, and now helping her through her recovery. We 
pray that you would continue to strengthen her and encourage her. We pray for Michael that you will be with him. Give him all the patience and equip him, Lord, as he, he helps to take care of Tara and the kids, Lord. We just pray for your, your hand to be in that family. Father, we thank you for Kelly, who's not feeling well, Lord, but this COVID test came back negative, Father, and just a, a sense of relief through that. We thank you, Lord, for your hand there to be with Kelly. Just thank you. Thank you that she's feeling better this morning. Father, in the midst of all these praises and great things that you are doing, Father, there are some here this morning that lifted hands with unspoken requests. Father, things that are on their hearts that they want to share with you. Father, I, I encourage them now just to lift those things up to you, whatever they may be. Father, you know, you can see in their hearts and in their lives. You know what the struggle may be, what that obstacle may be. Father, we lift them up to you, knowing that nothing is impossible with you. So, Father, help us to remember the words of the song. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord the maker of the heavens and the earth. What a great helper you are, Father. So, Father, we lift up each of these unspoken requests to you and trust in you. Father, we pray that you'll be with us in the service as we worship you, as we open up your word, and as we look at it. Father, may we see your face, may we hear your voice. Will you be with the kids as they go downstairs? Bless them in Sunday school. Bless them in the nursery, Lord. Father, we just give this time over to you that you'll sanctify it and use it great and wonderful way. And we will praise you for it. We pray all this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In his wonderful name we pray. Amen. So I'll ask the praise team to come back up. In your worship.
Turn to your Bible. Said last week was probably the easiest scripture lesson you'll ever have to find because it was Genesis 1 1. Well, I guess this week should be the easier one because it's the same verse. If you find it last week, you probably find it this week. All you got to do is open up to the first page of your Bible to Genesis 1 1. We read this verse again and look at it. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapter 1, verse 1. But now, Quite a lot of you have it memorized. You've heard it so much. Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. For that God will continue to reveal us, reveal himself to us through that one verse. So we look at it this morning. The last week, I said we were going to start out a new sermon series looking at the book of Genesis. And we, we started that last week. And I said there's a, a lot in the book of Genesis. Right? And I was actually worried about last week with the house churches because I, I prepared like a little email. I sent the house churches so that they can lead their discussions and, and kind of have their house churches. And I was worried, you know, with just one verse to look at, would there be enough for them to actually lead a house church where they have enough discussion uh, because we were just looking at that one verse. But at least in the two house churches I'm involved in, we had plenty to talk about from that one verse, right? There was no... No shortage of discussion and conversation. But I said the, the truth the last week is that we can honestly spend a month in Genesis 1 1. Maybe you thought I was joking, but here we are again. And I promise you next week we will move on to the next verse. But this week, I want you to I want to read a passage to you from a book by Dr. Henry Morris. His book is called The, the Genesis Record. And he writes this. He says, Genesis 1-1 is the foundational verse of this foundational chapter. It is the foundation of all foundations and is thus the most important verse in all the Bible. you ever think about that? Right? Do you agree with that? This idea that, that Genesis 1-1 is the most important verse in the Bible. Right? He, he postulates that this verse, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, he says is the most widely read words ever written in the history of the world. So as the Bible is the most popular book in history of the world, so many people have at least begun reading the Bible, and then even those who never made it all the way through have at least read those words to start. So he says, you know, an educated guess that this verse is the most widely read words ever written in the history of humankind. I guess there's no way to prove that. <coughs> My guess is many people have read Genesis 1-1, even if they never made it to Exodus 1-1, or Leviticus 1-1, or Hosea 1-1. But why come back to these words, right? You could say, we are never going to make it all the way through the book of Genesis, Pastor, if you spend two weeks on the first verse. People in my own church asked, okay, when are you going to get to the book, you know, the story of Abraham? I said, Abraham? I spent two weeks on the first ten words. It'll be 20 years before I get to Abraham, right? It's job security. <laughs> but do ten words really deserve two sermons? Right? Well, what else could we possibly say about this verse? But I want you to think about this. And it, it comes to a, another point by Dr. Henry Morris. He writes... It is often been pointed out that if a person really believes Genesis 1-1, he will not find it difficult to believe anything else recorded in the Bible. That is, if God really created all things, then he controls all things, and he can do all things. And I thought about that quote, that it, it makes a lot of sense, right? At Christmas time, we sing songs, and we read stories, and we talk about the virgin birth, right? That that Mary was a virgin and she was going to have a child. And, and some people said, come on. Right? You talk to someone outside the church, maybe even inside the church. Well, can I really, you know, how could someone really believe that? Right? That, that's impossible to believe. Or lots of stuff we talk about in the Bible. Right? We, we read stories every week of, you know, people raising from the dead. Right? Lazarus, Jesus, people walking on water, uh, God splitting the Red Sea. All these miracles in the Bible. Well, it's not so hard to believe those if we begin with the faith to believe Genesis 1-1, right? That we serve a God that can do the impossible. 
Matthew 19, verse 26, Jesus looked at them and said, With men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Right? So right from Genesis 1-1, we are asked, do we really believe that? I said last week we often come to Genesis with all kinds of questions. Questions of how and when, questions of where, and we, we bring all our list of questions that are good, valid, important questions. God is never afraid of our questions. But far too often we come to Genesis, I think, preparing for an argument, don't we? Right, the person who believes in the Big Bang and evolution, they, they come with their list of arguments, and, and the person says, no, God created the world in six days. They come with their checklist. And, and, and we come into a collision right as we open the Bible up to page one. But here's the key as we read this verse. There's a, a truth there. But if you walk out the door and you have all your where questions answered and all your why questions answered and all your how questions answered, but you're missing the who of Genesis, then ultimately it really isn't in a waste. Right? Who is this all pointing us to? God. Now listen to me carefully. Genesis is, I fully believe, giving us a creation account. I, I said last week that I'm a literalist. God is speaking. God is creating by his word the universe from nothing. The land, ex nihilo, out of nothing he creates. Right? This amazing passage that we're going to look at over the next few weeks. Says, Let there be light and there's light. Let the waters abound with abundance of living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Right? We, we go from nothing. Creation was without form and void to everything, to a full universe. Filled with space and time and matter. Planets and stars and redwood trees and beetles and blue whales. You know the blue whale is the largest animal to ever exist? Blue whales can reach 100 feet long. They can weigh 190 tons. 380,000 pounds. I was reading this week that the heart of the blue whale can weigh 400 pounds, just the heart of it alone. That's, that's a pretty amazing creation of God. And you, you and I can go up to the Gulf of St. Lawrence and we can see a blue whale from June until about September if we want to. And we could spend years and years in examining God's creation and just begin to scratch the surface, right? I was thinking about myself that I, I went to graduate school and, and I studied insects, entomology, for years. Right? Just insects, bugs, and mostly just aquatic insects, and I only learned a little fraction of what there is to know. But here's what I want us to see. Think about it. The Bible contains the creation of the entire universe in essentially one chapter. 31 verses. Compare that to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 spends 176 verses just on the Word of God. Right? That's six times as much on the Word of God. John, in his Gospel, John spends ten chapters alone on seven days in the life of Jesus, from Palm Sunday to Easter. Well, I think this should make it abundantly clear to us what God is saying, right? That the, the Bible's main focus is not to exalt creation or to in some way highlight it or give it to us in some great detail to explain it. Otherwise, he could have spent chapters on it. If God's main purpose in Genesis was to explain creation, he could have done so. And he certainly would have made it a more prominent part, right? He could have spent 31 chapters on it instead of 31 verses on it. No, his focus is to invite us to meet him. Right? It's about God. It's about our, our relationship with him. Psychiatrist Paul Trenier wrote, For God's, an God's answer is not an idea or a proposition, like a conclusion of a theorem. It is himself. Right? That, that's the answer that God wants you to find as you open up Genesis. He wants you to find him. Warren Morrisby wrote, The hurt child does not want to hear a lecture on bicycle safety. The child wants to feel his mother's arms and kiss, to hear the father's assuring voice. The theology is important, but only if its truths bring us closer to the Lord. Right? If you came to this Genesis study and you're like, okay, I've got some notes here, I'm going to go argue with somebody, I'm just going to 
see what pastor says so I can go have an argument, then you're, you're coming with the wrong idea to the sermon series, right? The sermon series and opening Genesis is all about us seeing God. And, and hopefully, as you see God, it makes your prayer life stronger. It, it makes your faith stronger. Paul wrote Romans 1.20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. That's us. Even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God says, all you have to do is open your door and look outside, and you will see existence, the proof of the existence of God. Right? You open up the book of Genesis, chapter 1 is creation. One chapter. Right? You could include chapter 2 if you want. How many chapters are there in the book of Genesis? Don't yell it out if you're wrong. It's an open book test. Just look. How many chapters are there in the book of Genesis? Louder? 50. 50. Alright, there are 50 chapters in the book of Genesis. Alright? Did you know that 39 of them, right, 39 out of 50 of those chapters deal with Abraham? Right? It deals with Abraham and his descendants. The covenant with Abraham it follows Abraham, then Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and, and his brother. Right? 39 out of 50 chapters in Genesis follows the line of one man. God's relationship with that family. Now again, please understand what I'm saying. But the Bible is not being written primarily as a scientific manual for us. That doesn't mean that it's not factual. That doesn't mean that it's some meaningless myth from an ancient people. But its primary purpose is to bring us into a loving relationship with its main character. The Lord Almighty. Right? We can understand all the history in there. We can understand all the science and the literature in it. But if we miss Christ, then ultimately it was all useless. Right? King Solomon, he writes in Ecclesiastes that I, I chased after all this knowledge I could find in the world. And when he obtained all that knowledge, he looked back at his life and he said, All is vanity and grasping after the wind. He concludes the purpose of life is to fear God and keep His commandments. So again, we, we come to Genesis and we have our, our questions, we want to have our questions answered, but as we open the Bible, the book of Genesis, again, is not so much about answering those questions. The main question it wants us to see is who? In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. All this is meant to point to Him. Morris wrote, it is vitally important if we would ever fully understand anything in the Bible, or in the world in general, that we first understand the teaching of Genesis 1-1. So I want us to, to revisit again, but I want us to, to look at the words found here. Right? We're going to go through them one by one and, and see what we can learn. And, and in the original Hebrew, they're in a different order. So if you have your bolts and the back of the bolts and kind of list the way they are in Hebrew, and that's how we're going to look at it. Now, I am not a Hebrew scholar by any means, but I spent the last two weeks trying to learn this verse in Hebrew. Now, if anyone can speak Hebrew and they want to come up here and read it, they're welcome to. I'm scared of the second service because I know Sarah can speak Hebrew, so get her up here. But if there are no takers, here it goes. Two weeks of study. Ready? This is Genesis 1 1 in Hebrew. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamahim vahet ha'aretz. Thank you, Internet. All right? <laughs> and now you just got it. All right? So I want us to look at those, that sentence, and, and what we can learn from it in, in what it says and in the Hebrew. The first word there is Bereshi. Right? It means begin, right? In the beginning. Now, Bereshi is actually how the Hebrew Bible starts. That's what it's called. The book of Genesis is called Bereshi. In the beginning. Right? Our, we call it the book of Genesis. Right? Genesis comes from the, the Greek translation, the Septuagint of the Hebrew Bible. And, and Genesis means origin or source. But the Hebrew Bible keeps that word, beginning, Bereshit. And, and we talked about this last week, that God in that moment creates time. In the beginning. Right? At least in the house churches I was in, it kind of, kind of blew everybody's mind even to kind of think about it. Right? There's a lot of Mouths hanging open and kind of pondering, <laughs> looking up. What does it mean to be outside of time? What does it mean to create time? 
Right? It's very hard to comprehend something before time. It's very hard to comprehend a God who is outside of time when we are so constrained by it. But God <coughs> creates time the beginning. We're also going to see in this sentence how he creates space and matter. The disciple Peter speaks about God, and he, he speaks about Jesus and this, this great plan of redemption, the cross. And he says that this plan that God had was formed before the foundation of the world was ever put together. Right? So before there was even time, God was working on this plan to save us. This is one of the mysteries of God. That God is eternal. At the beginning, Bereshit, he creates time. Benjamin Franklin once said, Dost thou love life? Then do not squander time, for it is the stuff that life is made. The next word in Hebrew is the text bearer, and it means to create. But here's what's kind of neat about it. That word, the second word in the Bible, is only ever used to describe God creating something. Specifically, God creating something out of nothing, right? There's a, a completely different Hebrew word that is used for when a person makes something, right? You go home and you, you build a house, or you create a sculpture, or you create a cake. It's a different Hebrew word that is used here, right? In Genesis 1.1, it is focused on God creating. God creating something out of nothing, a divine act. Paul wrote Romans 4.17, God calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Hebrews 11.3 By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things that which were seen were not made by those things which are visible. It's a, a great quote. Uh, astronaut John Glenn, when he's up in the space station, he's up, I think it was Discovery, he's, he's looking out the window of the space station and he, he's looking back at the earth from the space station. And he had this quote, he said, To look at this window as I did that first day, to look out at this kind of creation and not believe in God is impossible to me. So you have, in the beginning, you have created, and then you have the word Elohim. Elohim means God. Morris writes, The first occurrence of the divine name is the Hebrew Elohim, the name of God which stresses his majesty and omnipotence. And here we're introduced to God. And Elohim is kind of an interesting word because in it, it kind of has a, a plural sense. God is one yet more than one. From the, the very first verse of the Bible, there's a sense of the Trinity. Right by verse 2, we're introduced to the Spirit of God. It says, hovering over the waters. You know, as you read Genesis 1.26, God says, let us make man in our image. Right? As you think about that word, it's written all in the plural. Let us make God in, or man in our image. Right? I don't think God is leaning over the angels to get their input. Right? God is speaking in a way as, a, as the Trinity. Three in one. Let us make man in our image. H.G. Wells observed human life and he came to this conclusion well said religion is the first thing and the last thing and until a man has found God and been found by God he begins at no beginning and he works to no end he may have his friendships his partial loyalties his scraps of honor but all these things fall into place and life falls into place only with God how many people out there are trying to seek some kind of meaning to life, some kind of happiness, some kind of purpose, but they're trying to do it apart from God? And we can have our, our friendships, and we can have our scraps of happiness here and there. But Wells said, but it's not until you find God that everything kind of finally locks into place, because it was that God who created you in the first place. And it's that God who knows why he created you, how he created you, and he knows how you will find purpose and meaning and happiness. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, the next important word there is hashamahim. And it means the heavens, right? And it's kind of another plural word. Notice it doesn't mean the stars and the planets, right? That's day four, Genesis 1.16. Though it is a, a picture of space, right? The universe as space. So you, you have space, but then it says, and he created the earth. And that's the word ha'aretz, right? And this is a, a picture of matter. 
It isn't a, a picture of the planet Earth, because what does it say in the very next verse? Verse 2 says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was hovering over the water, the face of the water. So it says, the earth was without form. Well, you can think of it just as you think of the word, English word, earth, right? What, what can the word earth mean in English? Dirt, right? So you have earth as a planet, sometimes that's how we read this, like God is forming a planet at that moment. But we use the word earth to mean dirt, right? If you're a gardener and you go out in the spring and you're going to plant a garden, you, you dig it up and you say, well, I'm going to dig up the earth. I've got earth on my hands. I'm going to roll it till the earth. And, and so in a way, that's exactly how the author is using it. So in this verse, is essentially God speaking into creation now. What is our world made up of? What are the, the key elements of existence? Time? Space and math. Now what I think is neat, if you go back and you read this entire verse, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning is time, the heavens is space, and the earth is math. Well, what's the fourth thing we need? Energy, right? Right in the middle is that unmoved mover, God created. So this one single verse of infinite, well, is everything we need for the universe. Time, space, matter, and energy. Right, one last question. In our English Bibles, Genesis 1-1 is how many words? I'm not open with that. How many words are there? Ten. Ten, right? In Hebrew, it's a little more concise, and there are only seven words, right? Bereshit. Bera, Elohim, et, hashamahim, behet, aharetz. Seven words. Right? And Jewish scholars see this as a reflection of the seven days of creation. Right? Seven words, seven days of creation. The Bible often uses the word seven, or the number seven is symbolic of perfection, completion. God creates the world in seven days and saw that it was good. But I do want to say one last thing this morning. You know, as you have your questions and your discussions, right? Maybe you have questions in your mind right now. Maybe you're having a, an argument in your mind with me right now. Maybe you'll save that for house church. Whatever that is, right? Maybe your wife will tell you what you should have thought on the way home. <laughs> right? But as you think of all these discussions and arguments you're having, how do we approach this? Right? Even in the house churches I'm a part of, right, there were differing opinions. There are differing opinions on this verse and differing opinions on, on different points of creation. But the point of spending the last two weeks on Genesis 1-1, right, is I, I believe it's important. It's vital to our faith along with understanding the rest of the book. But I want to encourage you, do not approach it as an argument to be won. This really came up in one of our house churches, that, it, that it's really unlikely that you'll ever argue someone into the kingdom of heaven. And it doesn't matter whether we, we come with lots of scientific facts or we, or we come with a, a big long checklist of evidence. If our sole purpose is to win an argument, and you may well win that argument, then you probably won't see one more soul in heaven. And, and that's absolutely true with so many of the positions we sometimes take. Right? Whether you want to argue about creation or evolution, whether you want to argue about uh, abortion, pro-life, whether you want to argue about COVID or whether you want to argue about vaccines or masks, if we come to it as an argument for the sake of proving you are right, you'll probably not bring one person into salvation. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, we need to first have our minds and our hearts settled right, right? Make sure we know what we believe, what is the truth. That's why we study the Word of God. And then we need to come from a point of love towards our neighbor. They will not know we are followers of Christ by our arguments. They will know that you are followers of Christ by our love that is built upon His truth. This, as I said, the purpose here is not to answer every question, but to see God. G. Campbell Morgan said, Genesis 1, the purpose is to is God is declared. And, and maybe you have a, a lot of questions, right? And ideas when it comes to this passage, and maybe it's challenging 
But here again is the hope and the purpose for the sermon and really the entire series in Genesis. That God is declared. That I want to see Jesus. I want to see His glory. I end with this quote from author Christopher Morley. He wrote, I had a million questions to ask God, but when I met Him, they all fled from my mind and didn't seem to matter. More important than all our questions being answered is have we truly met God? That's what will make all the difference in our life. Let's bow in prayer together. This morning I want to give you a chance, just with your heads bowed for a second, your eyes closed. Just think about the, the message this morning. It'll give you a chance to respond. You know, maybe you have all kinds of questions. Good questions, great questions to ask. But the most important thing is, have we truly met God? This morning with your heads bowed, to think about that. Do I, do I truly know Jesus? Maybe I know a lot of his word. Maybe I've been in church for a long time. Maybe I have lots of questions, but I truly desire to meet Christ. I really want to know him to make all the difference in my life. that's something that's on your heart this morning, you feel him tugging at your heart, I encourage you not to resist that. This morning, if you'd like to say, I just want to, I want to know him more, I want to, I want to invite him into my heart, I want to know who this Jesus is, I encourage you just to slip your hand up so I can pray for you. I won't point you out, I won't embarrass you. If you say this morning, I really want to start that relationship with Christ, just slip your hand up. Amen. Else this morning. If you raise your hand a few seconds, God, I just want to encourage you to pray this, this simple prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I invite you into my heart. I may have lots of questions and I may not understand everything, but Lord, I know that you love me. I know that I'm a sinner in the need of a Savior. Lord Jesus, I ask you into my heart that you will answer my my questions and and be in my heart and lead me in a path of love. Lord, I want to be your child. I surrender my life to you. Please help me become a child of God and walk with you. I pray that if that's the desire of your heart, that you pray something like that in your heart, start that relationship and that walk with you. Share that good news with someone else that they can pray with you and help you in that. Heavenly Father, we do thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for Genesis 1 1 and what is found in it. Father, we thank you for the truth found in it. Father, we thank you that you are a mighty God. And as we come to this verse and these words, may it give us confidence in prayer. May it help us to see you in a new light. Maybe we are struggling with some obstacle in our life. Maybe we think our financial problems are too big, our, <coughs> our health problems are too big, that no one can help us. Father, help us to remember that there's a God who created everything we see. That is a God who loves us. The God who is at work in our lives. So, Father, as we read Genesis 1-1, maybe for the thousandth time in our life, may at this time spark a new burst of faith in our hearts. That we will see you in a new way. That this one verse opens up the Word of God to the rest of us. That we can't understand Jesus, we can't understand the rest of the Bible unless we first see that there's a God who started it all. Father, we pray that you will go with us in faith this morning. Help us to understand. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. We pray all this in your mighty name. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I ask you to stand as we close the worship this morning.
rendition is short and sweet, but I pray upon us all it's from Paul's letter to the Colossians, Colossians 3.16, may be true of us and desired by everyone. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Amen.